In the beginning, Big Anna was at one with the world, and the world was good. She stretched out her six-foot frame on the grass under the shade of a huge elm and breathed in the colours of the apple she had been given three hours before, the core of which she still clutched in her hand. She smelt the sky. She saw the noise of the London traffic encircling Hyde Park as a ripple of pulsating joy. She heard all the colours surrounding her as audible rainbows and the people speaking in rising modulations. She thankfully took some wine, felt it slip down her throat into her stomach, felt her body absorb it. She pulled hard on the proffered neat joint. She danced ecstatically, rolled on the freshly mown grass, then threw off her clothes and dived into the mercuric serpentine, wave upon wave of water retreating from her fast bulk and crashing into the shore. And the spirit of Guru moved upon the face of the waters. As she emerged from the lake, her new friends wrapped her in a long white robe, friends who also wore white, whose heads were shaved, and around whose necks were hung medallions containing the picture of a man's face, a dark, doleful face. It was the face of a man to be reckoned with. Stock exchanges would crush in its close proximity. Above all, a man not to be challenged. Her glowing, shining new friends, all whiter than white, who now seemed to have been her close friends for many years gone by, took her by the hand, led her to their land, and laid her in a room on huge floaty cushions. And then the men laid her, and laid her, and laid her again. Anna then slept ten long, eventfully dreamy hours after her first bite. She had been given an Eve's apple, heavily laced with lysergic acid, diethylamide. Once again, LSD had done its trick. Another young, dissatisfied soul had been extracted for the melee of humanity, to be re-educated and taught the true meaning of life, a soul who would see the light, and who would find happiness and satisfaction in the teachings of a man who had overnight become her God Almighty, who had in fact done nothing more than escape his own poverty trap and create enormous wealth for himself just by scrambling youthful minds. For Guru had said, Let there be light, and there was light. Eight out of ten similar mind-snap cases would awake the next day a hard and fast part of this cause, as she undeniably did, and Guru saw that this was good. And so for nigh on twenty years Anna was totally loyal to her new friends, and above all to her Guru, the man in the medallion's pictures all those years before. Not only was she loyal, but she became his companion, lover, his copesmate. She nursed him when ill, soothed his furrowed brow, bent over backwards, forwards, every which way for him, and always did his bidding. And then, as it happens, one day she turned away. London's royal parks in the halcyon days of the summer of 1968 were a minefield of drugged-up and generally lazy youth waiting to be swept away, though some were swept into psychiatric hospitals, just under the carpet, or even back into straight society. Some found their way into the clutches of the many religious and pseudo-religious groups set up by various gurus, dubious reverends, and the like. The beneficiaries of these organisations, by and large, of course, were the same dubious gurus and reverends. So this, dear listener, is the story of one of those poor souls, her subcontinental guru, a nasty virus, a vicar, a duke, and many too numerous to mention. It is also truly the story of a great sperm whale and a rotting tub full of Greek semen. Mm -hmm.